All right, so now I wanna shift gears uh, with this module and talk a little bit about the more mechanical properties of glass. And in particular, in this first module, we'll talk about failure. So in other classes, I'm sure you've talked a lot about the mechanical testings, uh, testing methods of metals, and maybe some for ceramics. Uh, but they tend to be different, right? Because there are inherent differences. So ceramics uh, are tend to be quite difficult to test in the typical tensile test because of flaws. Um, these flaws uh, result in a material that is stronger in compression than tension uh, due to crack propagation, which we're going to talk to some extent, and then also we'll circle back around later in the uh, semester when we talk about mechanical properties of ceramics in general. But they're stronger in compression. And because of this variation um, or this difficulty in testing, the fact that they're stronger in compression um, also means that the strength will vary depending on flaw size and location. So statistics become a lot more important um, in these materials. So we know brittle materials are weaker in tension. And again, that goes back to the flaws, which we'll try to show here uh, in a second. But this table kind of just shows you a ratio of the compression to the bending strength. And the bending has both modes of tensile and compression in it, uh, but obviously the tensile would be what causes it to fracture. And so we see that these various ceramics that we have um, all have uh, greater than one ratios, right? So that would mean that the compressive strength is much higher, four to six times seven, up to 30 times higher. And this just shows you the grain size because the grain size does affect the strength in, uh, in these brittle materials. All right, so the reason this, uh, the reason flaws matter so much um, and the way it differs between compression and strength and uh, tension um, is because of this crack propagation. So if we have a material, and this is you know a very idealized version, let's say we have this block of material and these slits are our cracks. Right? And so if you kind of zoom in, you get something that looks more like this, right? So if we're applying tensile strength, uh, stress here and here, then what happens is it's more, it's basically trying to open up this crack. Um, and that puts tensile stress on these edges. And these are basically um, concentrators. And so all of the stress kind of concentrates on these locations here, and it uh, allows it to break and unstably propagate uh, throughout the material and basically uh, break in half in a very unstable uh, way in which brittle materials shatter. However, the same material and compression, when we try to uh, put um, a compressive force on it, as you can see here, the same ones, and you see the, a different type of crack here, a different orientation, I should say, um, has both modes of uh, compression and tension um, on one side. And so what happens there is that these cracks uh, tend to kind of twist and propagate very uh, much more controllably. And so they're able to kind of like link up and eventually they'll break, but they tend to propagate much more stably than they do up here, which is when the stress reaches a certain level, these uh, will break. And again, I'm just trying to give you a rough idea of the mechanical properties. We'll come back and talk about um, what we call fast fracture in ceramics in more detail. I just want to give you a little refresher course uh, since we're going to talk about uh, ceramics. Uh, glasses and how we strengthen glasses. All right, so to kind of explain the discrepancies between strengths, um, a scientist named as Griffith um, suggested, again, flaws are the reason, and he basically came up with an energy balance. And so this is the energy balance that he came up with, and it involves two things. So the one side over here, the left side, um, you can see the lowercase e here, that represents elastic energy. 
So basically there is stored elastic energy in the material uh, when you subject it to force, right? And we can uh, express that in this uh, case here. So the elastic modulus, uh, crack size, stress, uh, and then obviously pi. On the other side, uh, the other part of the energy balance is that when you fracture a material, it creates new surfaces, right? You go from having uh, a crack in the middle of a material to having two new surfaces. And so um, that basically uh, costs energy. Um, and so when the stored elastic energy in the material overweighs that constraint, then we can fracture the material. And so this is a function of the surface energy and then obviously the crack size as well. And so we don't really need to get into the derivation of how to kind of go about this, but basically this energy balance uh, leads to what we call the Griffith equation, which is relating the fracture stress to um, the crack link. And so with this type, uh, if we have a um, tensile force um, and then we have a crack of length 2c. So this is an interior crack, we call it, uh, and its total length is 2c because uh, basically we think of this as double if it was on the surface. It would only be half of this. So that's why it's the 2c, if you're wondering. Um, so the, the failure stress is going to be related to the elastic modulus, the surface energy, and also that crack link uh, that we see here. And so that's known as Griffith's uh, equation. And this allows us to relate um, the length of a crack um, to when it's going to fail. And we see that the uh, larger those cracks are, the lower the failure stress is going to be, right? That's what this expression uh, is telling us.